The night sky, the dark blanket above our heads adorned with shining stars extending as far as the eye can see. One of the most appealing and mystifying of all sights. The beauty and the majesty of the universe have inspired awe and reverence in the best brains throughout history. There is a perfect brain behind all the natural physical laws. This most beautiful system of the sun, planets and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of a powerful and intelligent being. Please describe the symptoms of this manifest world. What is its background? How is it created? How is it conserved? And under whose control is all this being done? Many millennia ago, an advanced civilization revealed the mystery of the origin and nature of the cosmos. The term Vedic refers to the civilization of ancient India. Angkor Wat, the world's largest temple complex, with walls nearly one half mile on each side, was built between 1112 and 1150 AD in Cambodia. Astronomy and Vedic cosmology are inseparably entwined at Angkor Wat. The central towers represent Mount Meru, the cosmic axial mountain. The five internested rectangular outer walls and moats indicate chains of mountains enclosing the world and the cosmic oceans beyond. Science Journal noted that Angkor Wat had encoded precise calendrical, historical, and cosmological themes into the architectural plan for the temple. As many as 18 astronomical alignments have been identified within its walls. Rarely in history has any culture given rise to a structure that so elaborately and expansively incorporates its concept of the cosmos. Similar integration of cosmology and architecture is seen in the massive Indonesian temple at Borobudur. The temple was laid out using the ancient method of Vastu Purusha Mandala. This square diagram harmonizes architecture with the annual movements of the celestial realm. The temple was constructed sometime around 775 AD. His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, also known as Srila Prabhupada, author of 84 books on Vedic knowledge and founder of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness and the Bhaktivedanta Institute. He desired to erect the world's largest planetarium depicting Vedic cosmology through modern technology. He hoped that this gigantic virtual 3D animated model would give the contemporary world access to the Vedic cosmos. The Temple of Vedic Planetarium, that's we shall show the Vedic conception of planetary system within this material world and above the material world. Vishvanandana Swami, a prominent scholar of Vedic cosmology in the line of Sripad Madhvacharya, feels that the planetarium will expand the horizons of modern cosmological knowledge. We have a lot of information about this universe in our uh, Vedic and Puranic scriptures. So certainly a person who is interested in exploration, he would be, uh, he would get some material for exploration. The planetarium had many different exhibits, so you wanted some exhibits that would show it would create this doubt in the in science that they don't have the proper explanation and that the Bhagavatam has a better explanation. In the temple. 
mm. and that you know it would show the Vedic cosmology. Mm. And I think later on he said that even if the scientists don't accept it, we don't care. You know, we just show what's in the Bhagavatam. We don't care whether people accept it or not, but we should just show it. In a letter to Bhakti Swarup Damodar Swami, Srila Prabhupada delineated four phenomena to be explained in the planetarium. Explain the passing seasons, hmm. the eclipses and the phases of the moon, and the passing of day and night, etc. Then it will be a very powerful propaganda. The literature of that period contains a wealth of cosmological knowledge encoded in Sanskrit, arguably the world's oldest language. This knowledge has the potential to enrich our understanding of the cosmos we live in. A fundamental principle of Vedic cosmology is the existence of a dual reality, material and non-material. Here we see the non-material sky filled with innumerable planets of permanent stature. Among these, the topmost planet, Goloka, is shaped like a lotus flower and it is here that the super-intelligent designer of the cosmos, Sri Krishna, resides with his associates. Although knowledge of the non-material realm remains beyond ordinary perception, the Vedic knowledge of the material cosmos has been recognized as extraordinary by many eminent Western thinkers. As in Hindu mythology, it is a continual dance of creation and destruction involving the whole cosmos, the basis of all existence and of all natural phenomena. Long before it became a scientific aspiration to estimate the age of the earth, many elaborate systems of the world chronology had been devised by the sages of antiquity. The most remarkable of these occult timescales is that of the ancient Hindus. Indian cosmologists, the first to estimate the age of the earth at more than four billion years, they came closest to the modern ideas of atomism, quantum physics. To the philosophers of India, however, relativity is no new discovery. Just as the concept of light years is no matter for astonishment to people used to thinking of time in millions of kalpas. A kalpa is about 4,320,000 years. The Hindu religion is the only one of the world's great faiths dedicated to the idea that the cosmos itself undergoes an immense, indeed an infinite, number of deaths and rebirths. Thus the Vedic literatures answer the question whether the cosmos always existed or it had a beginning. The temporal arena of repeated universal creations and destructions exists in a corner of the non-material sky. material nature, which is one of my energies, is working under my direction, O son of Kunti, producing all moving and non-moving beings. Under its rule, this manifestation is created and annihilated again and again. The only religion in which the time scales correspond, no doubt by accident, to those of modern scientific cosmology. Its cycles run from our ordinary day and night to a day and night of Brahma. 8.64 billion years long, longer than the age of the Earth or the Sun, and about half the time since the Big Bang. And there are much longer time scales still. The material universe works on the principle of relative time. As such, a day of Brahma equals 8.64 billion years by earthly calculation. 
Since Brahma has passed half of his lifetime thus far, the age of our universe turns out to be approximately 155 trillion years. After another Brahma century, he stirs, recomposes himself, and begins again to dream the great cosmic lotus dream. Here we behold a form of the superintelligent being Vishnu, reclining in mystic slumber amid the causal ocean. When he exhales, millions of universes issue from his body and expand, until he inhales when all the universes return within him. The universe is a sphere encased by successive coverings of the elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether, intelligence, and ego. As a coconut has its hard outer shell and inner liquid, so the universe has its outer coverings and an inner space half filled with ocean water. On that ocean, another Vishnu expansion reclined on a serpent bed while being massaged by his consort Lakshmi. From his navel arose a lotus on which Brahma was born. Initially, the universe was pitch dark and Brahma engaged in meditation. Then he was empowered to create the universe. This account of creation may appear fantastic to some, but modern scientific theories also require fantastic leaps of faith to explain the origin of the universe. This is evident from the words of eminent physicist Stephen Hawking. Either we have failed to see 99% of the universe, or we are wrong about how the universe began. Vedic cosmology explains that the universe is made up of 14 vertically arranged planetary systems, or lokas. Each system resembles a galaxy and comprises stars, planets, and other celestial bodies. The topmost planetary system is Satyaloka, the abode of Brahma, which is at a height of 1.87 billion miles above Earth. Below the Satyaloka planetary system is the Tapaloka planetary system, the abode of the ascetics, which is at a height of nearly 1 billion miles above the Earth. Here, the ascetics live in a solitary, serene environment conducive for yoga and meditation on transcendence. Their disciplined life of joyous austerity prepares them for returning back to the non-material world. As we move down from Tapaloka, we pass through Maharloka and Janaloka until we reach the Svargaloka planetary system, also known as Heaven. The alignment of heavenly bodies around the pole star was elucidated by Srila Prabhupada in a letter. We can see that the night of the whole planetary system is turning around. And the pole star being the pivot is planet that is orbit fixed, but the sun is moving up and down, north and south. It is not that we shall accept the theory that the sun is fixed, and others are all going around the sun. That is not correct. In talks with leading disciples, Srila Prabhupada compared the revolution of planets and stars to a spectacular rotating chandelier. It's like a chandelier, and so all the whole thing is moving. And then he developed this idea of the temple of the Vedic planetarium and how he wanted, he'd always go like this, dom, dom. He'd hold his hand like that. And he'd say, and then from the center of the dome, a chandelier, uh, which shows the planets according to the Vedic version. Mm -hmm. Some spectacular kind of chandelier. This planet is his turn. He's rotating on these two heads. And it is hanging like the chandelier getting shelter on the pole star. And we can see every night. 
that the pole star or the North Star remains fixed and does not orbit in the sky is well known to astronomers and sailors alike. Less known is the fact that the pole star rotates powerfully on its own axis. The ancient Vedic text called Matsya Purana explains, the planets and stars are all attached to the pole star by invisible astral cords of wind called pravaha. The revolution of the pole star causes the orbital motion of other planets and stars. Through meditation, yogic astronomers visualize the planets and stars as different parts of the body of Shishumar, the transcendental dolphin. The Pole Star The topmost of the heavenly planets is like the capital of the middle universe. Here, the third form of Vishnu resides on an ocean of milk. In times of universal disturbances, the demigods headed by Brahma come here to appeal for help. The pole star is also the abode of Dhruva, a pure and exalted devotee of the Lord. Now let's look at the workings of our solar system. The mainstream scientific notion has been to portray the solar system as heliocentric or sun-centered. In the Vedic geocentric model, the sun, planets, and constellations revolve around the earth in an approximately 24-hour period. What may surprise many is that a geocentric or earth-centered model is also capable of explaining the cosmic phenomenon with equal if not better accuracy, as is confirmed by many eminent scientists. Either CS could be used with equal justification. The two sentences, the sun is at rest and the earth moves, or the sun moves and the earth is at rest, would simply mean two different conventions concerning two different CS. We know that the difference between a heliocentric theory and a geocentric theory is one of relative motion only, and that such a difference has no physical significance. Obviously, it matters little if we think of the earth as turning about on its axis or if we view it at rest while the fixed stars revolve around it. Geometrically, these are exactly the same case of a relative rotation of the earth and the fixed stars with respect to one another. Although the heliocentric model has been widely propagated, it has never been proven. There is no planetary observation by which we on Earth can prove that the Earth is moving in an orbit around the Sun. Mathematically, there is nothing wrong in this system because we are observing from the Earth and it is the relative motion that really matters. So if you assume that the Sun goes around the Earth, there is nothing wrong because it's a question of relative motion. The Vedas give amazing information about the Sun. Do you know what energy runs the Sun? Is it nuclear fusion? Is it volcanic energy? The Vedas say it is water. Yes, water. The sun evaporates water from all over the creation and uses it as fuel, just as lightning uses moisture. Modern science knows that sunlight contains many types of rays, such as ultraviolet, infrared, gamma rays, x-rays, etc. The Vedas describe that sunlight contains 100,000 different types of rays, each possessing specific subtle properties. Just as in a house, electricity regulates coolness, heat, light, sound, etc., so the sun's rays control heat and cold, day and night, summer and winter, darkness and light throughout the universe. The Vedic geocentric model explains how the sun moves around the pole star situated vertically above Earth's north pole. As the sun goes around the Earth globe, we experience